Retaking western Mosul, the Iraqi army and its allies begin the push against ISIL in the most populated part of the city. How challenging will it be? And is it healing or further dividing a torn country? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. After months of conflict, the Iraqi military and its allies have begun a major ground offensive to drive out ISIL from the western part of Mosul. Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi made the announcement during his appearance in Munich for an international security conference. Well, just a month ago, Iraqi troops took control of the eastern side of Mosul, the last ISIL stronghold in Iraq. Government forces are expected to target the city's airport first during this new phase. It's located at the southern edge to the west of the Tigris River, which divides the city. Western Mosul is where the old city centre is located. Commanders say the battle may be more difficult than in the east. Tanks and armoured vehicles might find it difficult to pass through narrow streets there. Our ISIL fighters have also developed a network of passageways and tunnels that could aid their defence. Hundreds of military vehicles backed by air power have started the push towards the west. The army says it took control of two villages south of the city in the first hours of the operation, but at least 750,000 civilians are trapped in western Mosul. The UN says their safety must be a priority. On Saturday, the Iraqi Air Force dropped leaflets warning residents and telling ISIL fighters to surrender. <laughs> We are announcing the launch of a new operation in Nineveh to liberate West Mosul, as we did before to liberate other parts of Mosul. We are asking our victorious battalions to fight and liberate citizens of Mosul from ISIL forever. Our first priority is to free human beings before freeing the land. I am asking you to help the residents and the refugees alike and to provide all humanitarian aid to everyone in need. Our heroes, you have stunned the world by your strength and dedication and I applaud you for your hard work. Now, ISIL took control of Mosul in June 2014. It was there the armed group declared a so-called caliphate across Iraq and Syria. The battle to recapture Mosul began in October last year. It's a joint offensive by the Iraqi army, Kurdish Peshmerga fighters and a US-led international coalition. A month later, Iraqi ground forces entered Mosul for the first time since the city fell. As the offensive progressed, they took control of towns and villages in the surrounding region and cut several ISIL supply routes. At least 140,000 people have been displaced by the fighting. Eastern Mosul was recaptured by Iraqi troops on January the 24th. The assault was aided by U.S. air support and military advisers. Now, the final offensive on the heavily populated western side has begun. And the U.N. says an estimated 750,000 civilians are trapped there. Let's bring in our guests into the show. We have joining us from the Iraqi capital, Ahmed Rushdi, director of the House of Iraqi Expertise Foundation. And in Athens, Judith Nurink, an Erbil-based journalist and author of The War of ISIS on the Road to the Caliphate. Welcome to the show, both of you. I could start with Ahmed. How difficult do you think this battle is going to be for the Western side? Well, first of all, we must think about how it started, because uh, the point that uh, uh, it started, it's supposed to be uh, all the details, all the military details, it's supposed to be studied and well, uh, uh, let's say, organized. Uh, just two, two, two main things. Number one, minimize the casualties uh, inside the civilians. And number two, to real capture uh, the ISIS leaders and the ISIS uh, uh, warriors inside uh, the western part of Mosul. But at the same time, it's not an easy. Uh, it, it will not be. Uh, it will not be an easy combat. Be, what, one of the most important things that, because uh, uh, the the old city is more complicated than the eastern part, 
the western part uh, has so many narrow allies, has so many, uh, let's say, uh, random uh, uh, houses and so on. So we are, we are talking about random uh, uh, campaigns that it's already built uh, in about, let's say, 13 years, which, is, which make the western part more expanded uh, because it has the more, uh, let's say, the more poor, uh, 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 the, the, the more poor percent of civilians that uh, uh, inside Mosul. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is an opportunity because the presence of the airport in the in the uh, uh, in the western side, uh, which which maybe it will be a pinpoint to make a major attack against ISIS uh, in the city. At the same time, it will uh, uh, let's say help the helicopters and, and so on uh, to, uh, let's say, be the, uh, a start uh, to, uh, uh, to try to uh, make booby traps against ISIS. And also, uh, if ISIS will, let's say, go more west, uh, it will be also uh, uh, targeted by these planes, by these helicopters from this air base. So I think the problem will be on the uh, on this airport uh, in the western side, this is the main thing. If it if it right. will be captured, I think uh, the the mission of the uh, Iraqi military forces it will be easier. All right. However, well planned, well studied. This is though, Judith. Um, in terms of the terrain alone, if not the time which ISIL has had to prepare for this going to make some of those goals Ahmed was talking about very difficult. The idea of just uh, waltzing in, avoiding civilian casualties, capturing ISIL's leadership in that sort of area, very difficult. It will make it very difficult indeed. Um, and don't forget the tunnels that ISIS has built. And also the latest news from Western uh, uh, Mosul is that they have been breaking through the walls between houses so that they can move around without being seen. Another um, strategy that ISIS has used in the East uh, is, of course, that they are going to use uh, car bombs, and they will uh, do, do that again in the, in, the, in the West. In the East, they were through. They didn't have them anymore because the uh, bridges be, uh, between East and West over the Tigris had been uh, cut, so they couldn't bring in new ones. But they have them, of, co of course, again in the West. Um, they will try in all ways also to use civilians as human shields. They already have them in some of the houses that are facing the river because they were uh, already uh, in, um, in battle with the Iraqi army across the river. So the civilians are really going to be the big issue and the UN has already asked the military to be careful, to take care about all those uh, 750,000 civilians that are still in the west of Mosul. Ahmed, as ISIL gets squeezed in Iraq, who is being empowered? We talk about the campaign against ISIL as if there is one monolithic entity which is uh, trying to retake the city, but that's not the case. Who's, who's being empowered here? Non-state actors and militias or the Iraqi government? I think it's uh, uh, the lesson have been learned well by the Iraqi government. It's still the Iraqi forces, uh, the Iraqi military forces, and mainly the anti-terrorism forces, which is, well, well, it is the elite of the Iraqi army, which is trained by the American forces, and they are well equipped. Uh, and they lost about 20% of, of their capabilities in the, uh, in the war against Daesh uh, in the uh, eastern side of Mosul. Uh, uh, they are leading the campaign. The, this is for sure, and uh, supported by the other Iraqi military forces and uh, the federal police. Uh, there are, they have also special forces from the federal police also assisting the, the, the military forces. Uh, maybe, maybe we're going to see how much it is important to have uh, uh, what you call it a pinpoint inside the, the western side of Mosul. Uh, to make pinpoints, to make bridges, that it will easy to uh, move the troops from the eastern side to the western side. Well, At the same quite time, reliant, have I they think not there will be on, on uh, some of the militia forces, which are not the Iraqi so-called anti-terrorism or, or army forces, right? They couldn't have done this alone, and there is a question mark of where that's uh, leaving those non-state yeah. actors. 
but the data now from the from the front in Sad, they are far away from the western side. They are in in Tel Afar, still there in Tel Afar. They didn't enter. They they didn't have. Uh, I mean, the militia, uh, the Hajdi Shabi, the the M the PMF. They they didn't enter Tel Afar. They couldn't enter uh, really liberate Tel Afar. So they are far away from from being uh, uh, with the military forces. Uh, to have pinpoints in the east, in the western side of Mosul, uh, yes, it's still the 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 Hajj al-Shabi, the PMO forces, uh, it still has has the capability to cut the way uh, if the ISIS troops will be let's say evacuate the the western side of Mosul and go to Raqqa and go to Hasaka and Raqqa and so on. Uh, they can do something like that, but also this. Uh, let's say this procedure, this military procedure, it's not easy. Uh, l l l right. yeah, well, let's be honest. It's still, ISIS has the power uh, to struggle inside the western side of Mosul at the same time to make so many problems even to the PMF. Before about one week, uh, uh, ISIS make a, a major attack against the PMF and they lost a lot. The PMF lost a lot, lots of casualties uh, uh, this attack. So right. it means that it's still, it's still the Iraqi army, still uh, the anti-terrorism units, still has the upper hand uh, to have uh, uh, this major attack on the western side of Mosul. Judith, let's talk about the Sunni population. What's happening to them? Are they being integrated as ISIL is squeezed out of Sunni areas, or are they being further alienated? It's a complicated situation because uh, on the one hand, um, as, as you were just mentioning, there is on the one hand the Shiite militias that are mainly outside Mosul. And we have had quite a bit of reports about the way they are destroying villages and houses, the way they are, um, yeah, then they're uh, having a, a bad role. But that's also the reason why inside the city, there's going to be mainly the Golden Brigade, which is special troops. Uh, and, and they uh, have shown in the East that uh, they, are, they are welcomed by the civilians. They're, do, they're playing a good role, although um, they also bring with them Shiite flags because a, a major part of the Iraqi army, also of the Golden Brigade, is Shiite. And that makes a problem inside Mosul as well. People are very happy to be liberated. They have been calling. I was in a radio station uh, the other day and I heard a lot of people from the West calling for liberation. Um, but of course, the Golden Brigade is okay. They will accept it. But uh, if, if the Shiite militias would come in, there would be a big problem. And definitely people would want to leave the city. Well, at the moment, the idea is that most of the people stay where they are and they have been asked in these, in these leaflets that were dropped to stay home, to uh, carry a white flag once they uh, would see the army and they would want to surrender. Um, but the idea is that they don't go, all of them, into the, the camps uh, that uh, in, in the uh, Kurdistan region already have about 180,000 inhabitants. So, so Judy, if um, I can jump so in here, I mean, are we avoiding that cycle or pattern that we've seen in Iraq before where one group is pushed out, we saw it with Al-Qaeda before, being pushed out of Sunni areas only for a vacuum to prevail because Sunnis simply don't feel welcomed or integrated into the state? and another group to rise like ISIL to fill that vacuum. Is there anything to suggest that this time it's going to be different? Yes, there is a, a, quite a bit to suggest it will be different because what we have already seen, and we didn't see that with the other places like Fallujah and Tikrit, that within days after their uh, areas were liberated on the east side of Mosul, people went back, uh, about 30,000 up to today. So that's not just a small amount. Uh, in, in the other cities, people were scared of the Hajj al-Shabi, of the Shiite militias. Um, they were scared of, of revenge, uh, so they stayed away, uh, often for months. In the east part of Mosul, we already see that life has gone sort of back to normal. ISIS still is dropping uh, grenades from drones. They still have suicide bombers, but the shops are open, but the police is there. So it is sort of back to normal. That's quite different from what we have seen before. 
Okay, Ahmed, people returning home may be one thing, but people to return to the political process may be another. Have we seen progress being made in the central government towards some of the demands of the Sunnis, things like scrapping the anti-terror law, uh, releasing prisoners, uh, women who they say are, are held unfairly in, in jails, uh, raids on civilian homes, which they say are really just a pretext to terrorize the Sunni population and so on and so forth? Well, frankly speaking, it's a challenge for the Iraqi government. It's supposed to be a clean combat, a clean warfare. At the end, we need to minimize the casualties of the civilians, from the civilians. This is first. And secondly, try to manage to rise up the reputation of the Iraqi army, not the PMF which is a very important issue after the complete liberation of Mosul. Why? Because people will wonder, OK, you are now liberating us from ISIS. What's your plan for, to rebuild the city? How you can imagine uh, the Mosul to be uh, an Iraqi, uh, a real Iraqi province with a, with a Sunni majority? How you can respect the Sunni majority? Uh, is there any? Uh, uh, is there any, uh, uh, let's say, attempts from the Iraqi government to push the Sunnis uh, to be inside the political process by preparing everything after the liberation of Mosul? It's a way. It's a. It's a major challenge for the Iraqi uh, government, honestly speaking. Uh, it's. An, it's. It is not an easy way. Uh, okay. Uh, and it's a, it's I a think Haider al-Abadi forced forced to. Uh, I think Haider al-Abadi forced to announce the liberation uh, to start the liberation of the western side of Mosul in Munich, because he knows very well that the international community made lots of pressure on him uh, to uh, to start a new era uh, with the process with the political process in Iraq that it will be really inclusive for the whole Sunni inside uh, uh, the whole state of Iraq, uh, which means rebalancing the power uh, uh, and uh, try to manage the errors that happened in this previous 13 years, which is also not an easy uh, way to solve problems because uh, uh, Labadi has opponents and he must also consider his Shiite opponents because he needs to be, uh, well, he has a struggle and uh, a real struggle between his Shiite opponents, and uh, he wants to be right. also a prime minister after the next elections. All right, you, you've raised a point that we'll, we'll come back to when we're talking about the intra-Shiite struggle, uh, the PMF being the popular uh, mobilization forces. But before we go there, briefly, Judith, if this is going to be a long and drawn out conflict, and we've got, what, about three quarters of a million civilians trapped in there in western Mosul, what would an extended period of conflict mean for those people for basic supplies of, of necessities of life? Absolute disaster. Because now already people are complaining that the only thing they have to eat, one meal a day and only potatoes. There are people that are complaining that ISIS is taking goods off the market. It seems that the fighters are getting what is still there. Prices of simple things have gone up enormously, so people can't buy them anymore. So if this takes a long time, uh, not only foodstuff, also water, that's not there in, in, in a clean capacity, um, electricity, um, this, the, this is going to be a complete disaster for the, for the population. It's a very difficult situation, perhaps uh, awaiting civilians there. Coming back to the point, Ahmed, that you raised about intra-Shiite tensions. We've seen tensions erupt between Sadrists and uh, other Shiite factions in protests recently. We've seen, according to the Institute of War, reporting on February 17th, that some of these Shia militias even launching rockets against others in Baghdad. Are we going to see this parallel process as, as progress takes place in Mosul against ISIL and ISIL gets squeezed, that the attention of some of these Shia militias is going to turn against each other and how to position themselves better for a sort of post Mosul scenario? Well, I don't think that the Shiite militia will turn to each other in a way or another be because of two things. Number one... Well, are we already uh, seeing signs have, of that? The protests, well, the Sadrists, the yeah, shelling? Yeah, yeah, but still... Yeah, Sami, but still there is a tent called the National Alliance and there is a major tent called Iran. So 
it can be, yeah, there, there will be some disputes, but I think it's my personal opinion is that at the end, there will not, there, there will not a real civil war. Uh, well, intra Shiite militia will uh, uh, do it in a way or another. Uh, this is first. And secondly, uh, I think we must also uh, make a base is that ISIS is not only a warrior group, it's an ideology. So uh, it will be always, always presented. So if there is minimizing the security level, the minimizing the security situation, or let's say there is a conflict between the central government, and the local government, or there is a conflict between uh, intra Shia militia, or there is a conflict between Sunni and Shia, ISIS will all be, always be there, and maybe with another name, another Khalifa, and it will also go forward and occupy the Sunni area. So it's a real challenge that the international community that's why I said that the international community make, I think he, 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 the international community made a huge pressure on Haider al-Abadi to solve problems between Sunni Shia, intra-Shia, intra-Sunni. And we all know that there is a Geneva uh, conference or let's say the, the Geneva meeting uh, with the uh, Sunni leaders and so on. So there is a real movement to, st uh, to try to manage things be be before the ending of the uh, uh, liberation of the whole Mosul because everyone is actually afraid right. of Mosul to be liberated from ISIS because if there is no plans uh, uh, to deal with all these challenges uh, definitely there will be another thing to think about after the liberation of Mosul. All right I want to uh, pick up on that point Judith we shouldn't forget this is not just simply some domestic uh, conflict or civil war there's a lot of regional and international powers involved where is the squeezing of ISIL leaving the regional tug of war? Um, the, the problem is really that the Sunnis uh, in Iraq are so divided. Um, there have been uh, in, in problems for quite a while since the Shiite took over power and they hardly got any, any influence anymore. And that has, this has led to the Sunni population in Iraq feeling really as the victim, first the victim of the Shiites and now the victim of ISIS. And if there is not a political situation where they feel that they are, that they are heard, that they're, they're not only their voice is heard, but also that they get uh, a position in the Iraqi government or even a form of, of autonomy, um, then definitely the groups that are always there, that are, are already there in the liberated areas of, of, of Mosul, they will again um, come above the ground and, and play a role. Well, do you see, Judith, from, I mean, you're familiar with the region. Do you see that there is a post Mosul political plan? No, there isn't. And actually, I spoke That's to worrying, one of the... Uh, it is terrible. Uh, I spoke to one of the uh, Kurdish uh, top uh, politicians recently who told me that the Kurds have tried time and time again to get this plan but that in, in Baghdad there is no interest to do so until the battle has been fought. And it's, it's a disaster if there isn't a real political situation. And the situation now in the east of Mosul is that the uh, provincial council of Nineveh is back in the city, partly at least, but they are not doing what people is, are, are, are needing. They, people in the east are complaining we don't have water, we don't have electricity, our salaries are not paid, so we don't have money to buy food so still there is a terrible situation that if this goes on will lead to people going back to those groups that they might have more um, uh, more more the idea that they will help them all right we've got about 30 seconds so ahmed very briefly what do you make of suggestions by the u.s defense secretary that perhaps the u.s is looking into sending ground troops into iraq and syria very briefly 30 seconds well, I, th I think the international community, the American forces, the coalition forces, the NATO needs to be inside Iraq. First of all, because of Daesh. Secondly, to try to, uh, let's say, uh, rebuild the, the whole Iraqi forces, the whole uh, uh, Iraqi military forces in a way or another. Because I think uh, it's now global terrorism, not only on Iraq, not only on Syria. It's now beca become global terrorism. And, right. and, and the, the causes of global terrorism, it's not only uh, military security. It's also political and social.
All right, we'll have to leave the discussion there. Let's thank our guests, Ahmed Rushdie and Judith Neurink. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here. For now, it's goodbye. <laughs>